That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Where the Crawdads Sing, the second film directed by Olivia Newman, which Sony Pictures is releasing July 15th, 2022. It is, of course, based on the runaway bestseller by Delia Owens, published in 2018, a literary sensation. Uh, and if, uh, Reese Witherspoon uh, notably produced this film. The director? Uh, Olivia Newman. Her first film? Uh, is a South by Southwest premiere called First Match that is on Netflix in 2018, uh, which has a really great uh, cast, uh, including Yahya Abdul-Mateen and Coleman Domingo. I really liked this movie. No, let me rephrase that. There are aspects of this film I really liked. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I can see how it probably was a much better novel, albeit uh, Pulp Fiction, uh, but there were a lot of things that I thought were really rough around the edges. I often say this, but for this story, for real, for real, this needed to be a miniseries. Yes, because uh, as is, they've condensed a 400-page novel into a very glossy uh, romantic melodrama. Yeah, a lot of it feels very basic, but mm. um, the story... It feels kind of like a biopic about this lady named Kaya. My neck, my back. Every time they say her name, I think of that Kaya. But um, anyway. So Kaya, for most of her life, is played by... Daisy Edgar Jones of Fresh. All right. So we meet Kaya as like a seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's grown up in the 1950s in like a swamp in North Carolina somewhere. The backwoods swamp, yeah. And she's had a tumultuous upbringing because her dad is painted like a monster. Who's uh, Garrett Dillahunt. He's whooping everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. To the point where the mom one day grabs her coat and pocketbook and just walks out. Mm -hmm. Like just abandons the family. And then we see the dad is, continues to be very abusive. So I think there are five siblings total. Mm -hmm. And one by one they leave until it's just little Kaya, a seven-year-old, with her dad. And then we sort of get her learning how to take care of herself. And she says that she's learned to survive by just staying out of his way and being invisible. Mm -hmm. One day a letter arrives in the mail from the mom. We never learn what that letter says, but it makes the dad very upset. And then he leaves. Mm -hmm. So now this little girl is stuck in this cabin in the swamps by herself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to wrap it up, she we see her grow into a teenager, like a 16 or 17 year old, and she falls in love with a guy named Tate, mm -hmm. played by... Taylor John Smith. And he loves her, she loves him, he teaches her how to read, which we need to get into. And then he uh, graduates high school and goes off to college and tells her, she's upset, like, you're never going to come back, you're going to leave me. And he says, I'll be back. He leaves during the summer to start, like, a job on campus, and he tells her, I'll be back July 4th. Meet me on the beach where we watch the fireworks. I'll be back. We see her go to the beach on July 4th, and of course he never shows. She's heartbroken, moves on. Then she meets another man named Chase, mm -hmm. played by... Harris Dickinson. Who I know from... Uh, beach Rats. Okay. Chase is important because the opening of the film is, we see a dead body in the swamp. And that dead body belongs to Chase. Mm -hmm. And it appears that he's been... The police immediately think he's been murdered and that he's been pushed off of a watchtower and Kaya is charged with his murder. Mm -hmm. So with the very little evidence. I we guess. can get into it, but the film is sort of framed around this narration that Kaya is providing to her lawyer played by David Strathairn. So pretty early on in the film, he, he, greets her in her jail cell and says, hey... He comes out of retirement to defend her. Very little is explained about why he's doing this for her. But he, Guilt. Which we can get into. But he tells her, I'm going to represent you. In order to do so, I need to know about you. Because, you know, I'm from this town. We all just know you as the, the merch girl. Like, swamp girl. The, what, the marsh girl? Marsh girl. Sorry, not the merch. merch. <laughs> Swamp trash. <laughs> the marsh girl, like like swamp trash. Like Nev Campbell and Wild Things. But yeah, basically. So and they were and like the townspeople think she's like the missing link, which we also need to talk about because that makes no sense that they all think she's like this crow magnum, like what whatever. He says you need to tell me about your life, and so eighty percent of the film is basically her recounting her life to this lawyer. Mm -hmm. 
So getting back to Chase, she falls in love with him. Everything seems okay, although to the audience immediately, this Chase boy seems like a creep. And we find out he never, he just, he spends a lot of time with her in the marsh. He never wants her to come to the city. And one day she goes to the city because, we, we can explain it better, but she becomes an author because she draws and she makes, makes like science books. So that's how she makes money and supports herself. She's in town one day to like, because she got a new deal or something and she bumps into Chase and she meets Chase's fiance. With a big rock on her finger. So he's been lying to her. He's, he has a woman and he tells her, well, I could never be with you. You're like the Marsh girl, but I do love you. Mm -hmm. They get into a fight, like a physical fight. And then everything kind of stops there because then we go back to the court trial. So intermittently throughout the first, you know, hour and a half is the, you know, the court trial. Everything culminates with that uh, jury's decision and spoiler alert, they find her not guilty. So we also see Tate, her first boyfriend, come back into her life. Mm -hmm. And he says, I love you. I've always loved you. The reason I didn't come back on July 4th is because I thought you're never going to leave the marsh. So we couldn't have a life together. But now I realize that was a mistake. He sees that Chase has been abusive to her. So as the audience, we're like, well, he did it. He must have killed. He also had a mysterious red beanie. There's a red beanie involved. And also, when Chase is killed, Kaya's out of town. And Tate knew that. He tells her, go out of town for a few days. When you come back, I'll be here. So, of course, we think he did it. But the gag is, and we can get into the chronology, but we see Kaya in modern time. So she's like a 70-something or 80-year-old woman. And she's still living in the marsh. She ended up developing a relationship, like a long-term relationship with Tate. So he lives in the marsh with her. And one day she goes out on her little trip on the boat in the swamps. And she sees her mom, like a vision of her mom. And then we get sort of like her visions of her as like a young girl, a young woman, and now this old woman saying hello to her mother. And then she dies in the boat. Mm -hmm. So her man, Tate, we don't know if he, they ever got married. He finds her in the boat. So of course he's upset, like sad. And then he's looking through all her stuff, like, you know, cause she's dead. And he finds a book where she's basically written her life story. Mm -hmm. And she gets, he gets to the chapter about Chase. And what does she say about Chase? That uh, she's comparing herself to like an animal in the wild and you have to kill your natural predator. You have to kill your predators. Oh, it's very important to know. Chase, in that time that Kai and Chase were in a relationship, she made him a necklace out of a shell that is very rare. It's because, supposedly an anomaly to the Because that species is not indigenous to the area. Some kind of scallop or something. So he made, she made him a she, necklace. She makes him this cheap-ass little necklace. And the mom of Chase uh, in court testifies that he never took that necklace off. He wore it 24-7. And she saw him the day he died, the mom did, like at breakfast or whatever, and he was wearing it. But then when the dead body was found, it was missing. So whomever has that necklace probably killed his ass. Mm -hmm. But in the trial, it's revealed that the police did search Kaya's house and never found the necklace. Well, Tate, as an old man, after Kaya's died, reading this book and reading that she said you have to kill your predators, he turns the page and there's like a cutout in that damn book and that necklace is in there. Mm -hmm. So she killed him. Mm -hmm. The end. Oh, I got emotional many times throughout the movie, particularly because I didn't mention that for the bulk of Kaya's life, especially when she was a young girl, there is a black couple who own the general store in town. Named Mabel and Jumpin. And they sort of take a liking to Kaya and basically help her survive. Yeah, they're kind of like parental figures for her. They guide her. They, she has a deal with them. Kaya has a deal with these two people that she will bring them um, shells or... Mussels. Mussels, like the animal in the shell that she's harvesting from the water. And she brings them and they give her money and they help her with stuff. And they seem to care about her. Help she, her escape social services. She care, Yeah, she cares about them. Um... Almost every scene with those people, I got emotional. Because well, can you imagine being a black couple in the 1950s in North Carolina around all these racist-ass white people? And we get 
you know, we get flourishes of like, you know, barely, barely yeah. of like how they probably were actually treated. And then for them to still like risk themselves for this little white girl, it just got me rather emotional because they seem very kind. Even the relationship between the two, they seem like a sweet couple. They do. They're played by Michael Hyatt, who I really like from Nightcrawler, and she was in uh, The Little Things with Denzel. Uh, and so that worked well. Sterling Macer Jr. plays Jump In, and he's been around forever, a character actor. Yeah, I really like those two characters. I also thought the main girl, Daisy, whatever her name is. Edgar Jones. I thought that she did a very good job as Kaya, and I was very invested in Kaya. Like, I wanted, like, I wanted her to be okay sure i think it's a good characterization i think a lot of it is very unrealistic and fantasized in how growing up in a swamp would be can i just go to where, go through my where notes? the crawdads sing but the mosquitoes don't sting apparently okay this dad there's no interiority to this dad the minute we meet him he is just kicking ass and taking names is that the phrase yeah is that what people say taking oh okay. whooping ass and take whatever he's awful i prefer i'm here to chew bubblegum and kick ass and i'm all out of bubblegum but i'm here for both yeah whatever anyway as the kids are leaving these are not adult children like i mean they're not adults they're, yeah, they're teenagers they're teenagers and then the the brother is young jody where did they go everyone's missing like and then later on after uh, Kaya publishes her books because she becomes very proficient in like illustrations and then she becomes like a genius because apparently she's read every book in the library. Like Goodwill Hunting. It's unbelievable. Um, but uh, she is super smart when it comes to like zoology and the animals in the region that she lives in. So she makes these encyclopedias that are selling very well. So she's making a lot of money. She's like John James Audubon. Basically. So her books are out in the wild. And her, one of her brothers, the youngest one, I think his name is Jody. Yes. He's in the armed forces now. He's like in his neighborhood and sees one of his sister's books and thinks, I'm going to go find her. And he does. And even he says, I don't know what happened to any of our siblings. I know our mom died. And then the brother gives her backstory like, our mom did try to... Well, that's, what's so, that's what I also don't appreciate is they kind of take the mother completely off the hook because they explain that she was kind of in a fugue state, forgot that she had children. Yes. And then <laughs> kind of tries to get them back, talks about getting lawyers, and then dies of leukemia. So it's like... It's all... It feels like in the book there might be 60 pages dedicated to that, but in this movie they give us like... 35 seconds. I assume the book has a lot more finesse, but uh, there, it does feel very clunky. I, I really think it kind of negates interiority for everybody, including Kaya. Well, yes, because, okay, oh my god, there's so much. Well, let me continue so I don't lose my place. The, the premise of the narration and how the story is framed is the lawyer coming to her and saying, I need to learn about you. And initially, Kaya's very cold, like she, she's, she, she's mute. And then all of a sudden, she just tells all of her business. He gives her a book that he knows that she'll respond to, presumably like shells, because of right? her publications. And she's, she's, her first line is, people forget about the creatures that live in shells. Which seems to me like they're trying... Uh, well, the, she comes out of her shell immediately. Yes, but the uh, screenwriter, Lucy Alibar, I think is trying to probably convey the feeling, the, the poetic essence of the book. But these are things that she might not say out loud. And <laughs> yes, know. yes. A lot of the dialogue seems like it would be something that she's thinking. And we can get into her communication because when we get to her learning how to read. But so the story is not told in order. It's, it starts in 1979 when Chase is Six, found dead. 69. 69? Yeah. Are you sure? Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's 79. No, because she was born in 1945. Yeah, so she was in her 30s when she was in court. So that'd be she was 34. Oh, I thought it was 68, 69 when that happened. But anyway, I might be wrong. I digress. Okay, well, I'll take responsibility. The chronology I have is 1979, then we go to 1953 when she's a little girl, then 1962, 1968, 1969, and then present day. So... I think the way the story bounces around the court trial eliminates a lot of the suspense. There's no tension and the uh, all of the interactions between uh, the police and the uh, mortician and uh, the courtroom melodrama all feels very elementary. Yes, I agree. How, yes, however, 
I do think the film did keep me... So there were moments when I forgot she was even on trial. Yes. I forgot that a man had died. I even forgot... We, there are scenes where we're like watching her and Chase and I forgot that he's dead. So I think that's, you know, a fail. However, there is enough... I did care enough about her that when we would go back to the courtroom scenes, I was very anxious. Like, whatever the case may be, I want her to be found not guilty. Even if she did kill this man. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, and it, it very much has that energy. It's just that everything in between, it, I, I think those are so cliched in all of those moments in the courtroom. And then everything, the romance between these two different men is as slow as, you know, molasses. <laughs> like, like there's so many pauses and, and, and it, it is so dull. And then we have this rush montage of her like learning everything as fast as possible. Well, that's my next note, which I think probably relates to what you were saying about it being unrealistic. So when she's... I believe it's like 1962 when she meets Tate. So she would have been like in her late teens. Like she's still in high, high school age. Yeah, she's like 17 because then that signifies when she has the cake, I think that she's 18. Oh, you're right. Yes. So Tate meets her and he thinks she's really pretty because she is, which we also, that's another note I have I'll get to. He says, I can teach you how to read because she doesn't know. He writes her a letter because they're exchanging feathers, which is a thing they do throughout the film. Mm -hmm. And he writes her a note. And when she finally meets him, she says, I don't, I can't read your note. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, basically I said this. I can teach you how to read. And then they're not together that long before he leaves for college. It's not even a year. And then she learns how to read like... And then she learned, she says she's read all the books in the library and her knowledge of like science and the and general science, like is PhD level. Oh yeah. She can talk about why the sky is blue. Uh, <laughs> but then we hear her read after that and she sounds kind of remedial. Like if she were in 11th grade and got up to read a poem like that, the mm -hmm. kids would snicker at her. Mm -hmm. But then when she's talking, she sounds like Toni Morrison. Like I just don't... Like, it's a little confusing sure, and that how she's so eloquent and then she seems so intelligent, but then sometimes it seems like, do you actually know how to read? I don't know. That montage is so earnest. I wanted it so badly to be like when Jerry Blank learns to read in Strangers with Candy. Hobo camp. And they're, they're aping um, the miracle worker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, both of these, Harris Dickinson and uh, Taylor John Smith. Taylor John Smith, you probably know from Stranger... Uh, in the shadow in the cloud with Chloe Grace Moretz. Oh. Um, Harris Dickinson is also, I thought, quite good in The Kingsman and recently in Triangle of Sadness. But they both look very similar. They as do does look her adult brother. Well, the four of them are very good looking people. For swamp people. For swamp people. And the one, Chase, I mean, he has like, his teeth are, I mean, they all have beautiful teeth that are very white. I mean, granted, the two boys. Um, probably have like more access. Well, actually, yeah. Tate, his dad is like a shrimp farmer. He's a shrimper. It seems like maybe he didn't. Somehow, these people look very good. They have good dentition, great skin. That seems kind of like unbelievable. Taylor John Smith was reminding me of a young John Dahl from like the film Gun Crazy in the fifties. I'd have to look that up. But um, da Daisy Fuentes, whatever her name is, she's she's, I mean, she's a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need to get into that. The charges of saying that she's the swamp thing. She's regularly in yes. town. The only thing wrong with her is she's not uh, got a face full of makeup like all the other women and wearing the current fashion. Right. She just looks like a regular human. They all refer to her like she is like a cave woman. But then and again, even, even when we see her get dressed up one time and it's after she's published her first book, got this money... And then they're asking for a second book. So she has to go to a bigger city to meet her publishers. So she gets all dolled up. And everyone in town sees her. Because that's part of her alibi in the court trial is that she left on a bus to go out of town. And she, she looked better than everybody in that town. She could have been Holly Golightly. She looked like something out of Breakfast at Tiffany's. That's I don't Holly know. Golightly. Oh, <laughs> okay. I've seen that movie at the Castro in San Francisco. Yes, I brought you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wouldn't With have George known. Pappard. And that awful Mickey Rooney... Uh, I would it, argue she's the baddest bitch in town and they still think she's like the missing link. That made no sense to it, me. It, it's they so need stupid. to they needed to make her look more feral then mm -hmm. or give her like weird teeth. She but needed, then it wouldn't explain why these two hot guys like her. She needed to look like the way she grew up, she would need to look like the kid in Francois Truffaut's The Wild Child. Like she grew up in the wilderness. She's a wilderness yeah, kid. Yeah. Um 
And the, the, to have had no health issues whatsoever the, but prior to her learning everything about even the biology of her body. Does she yes. understand like what menstruation is, like what's happening to her? This is why I think we need a mini series because I wanted to know about that. Like it, they just make it like this was a little girl. I mean, presumably Mabel helped out with some of those things. I don't know. I, that's what I assume. But also like her. Yes. Yeah. There, there. I just have so many questions that would have made such an interesting story. But as it is. My only, my last note is when we see Tate as an old man, mm -hmm. I thought he looked like Leslie Jordan. <laughs> oh boy. That's your last note. Okay. Okay. So what would I have preferred if I can't have a mini series? I wish the film would have been like centered on the court trial and we get more of those details because it is effective the way it is in that as the audience, I wasn't sure if she killed this guy or not. It seems like... I was sure she did because we never allude... We never kind of point a lens at Tate. Like, nobody's accusing him, even her. Sure. Uh, because she did it. And, uh, yeah, that, just that, that we never go back to it. And she also is never saying that she didn't do well, it. Well, yes. So, we never point the finger at Tate. But I, I, I assume she was trying to protect him. And then, yes, she never says she didn't do it. From the moment the lawyer sees her, all she, ever, all she says to him is, I can't stay here. Mm -hmm. so looking back after watching the movie I'm like oh because she did it so yeah I wish it would have been framed around the court trial and then we get flashbacks to her upbringing so as her lawyer is explaining who, her character right th that, I feel like that would have made more sense as giving exposition on her life but the fact that it's being framed like she's telling her lawyer about her life it just seems like a lot it, yeah, it, it really hobbles the film's energy. And why does she basically. trust him? Like, she seems so closed off to everyone. Why him? Because he was she, nice once as a girl. She does say towards the end, like, you know, you were always nice to me as a little girl. Because we get a scene of him seeing her, like, the first and only time she ever went to school, which only lasted, like, ten minutes, because all the kids made fun of her and she left. Before she walks into school... She gets a uh, second thought and, like, wants to leave. But the lawyer sees her and says, you know... He sees her beforehand. He sees her before she walks to the school and he can tell that she's going to leave. And he goes, you know, you have just as much a right as all these other kids to go to school. So get your ass to school. So I can see why she had a, a an affinity to him. But I mean, I guess I just go back to like this. This story is so rich that condensing it to two hours just made it feel like. It almost feels like a YA. There were moments when I thought this feels like a Twilight movie. It yes, I thought that too. And but I there are there is an art to adaptation. There there is a way to have condensed this into a cohesive, uh, efficiently paced two hour film. But I don't think this is it. Um, it's way too glossy in almost every regard. Uh, you know this. I think uh, if it had been a miniseries, it could have felt like something like the Thornbirds. Uh, but it. <sighs> I do like David Strait Theron. I think he has, brings the, yes. the he brings the, this nice sense of empathy and gentility to this this kindly uh, older man. Uh, he he. I, at the same time, I kept thinking of Atticus Finch, you know Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird. He's very much cut from that cloth. Uh, what I, what the energy, you know, swamp people seem to hold a certain kind of grotesque fascination in a lot of cinematic uh, overtures. But I. I, I wanted this to be like Andre Konchalovsky's Shy People with Jill Clayburgh and Barbara Hershey, where Barbara Hershey plays that swamp woman in Louisiana that has all those kids that her cousin comes to visit mm. and write an article about. I, I don't know if you watched that with me, but I don't know. Barbara Hershey won one of her um, Cannes Best Actress wins for that, and I, that's highly worth watching. Barbara Hershey's won Best Actress at Cannes? Twice. Oh, wow. Uh, and that was, I think that was in 87. And I also wanted this, I think it... This, Shout out to Barbara Hershey. This really should have had the energy of, but not Jill Clayburgh, uh, of... Who's Jill Clamper? From a Married Woman, which we reviewed the Criterion of. Oh, with the long textured hair? Mm -hmm. Isn't she an airplane? No, that's Julie Haggerty. Do they look similar? They're both white lady of white ladies of a certain age and era, so yes. Uh, but I wanted this to have the... Uh, it, 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 this film really made me hungry to rewatch Ode to Billy Joe, which is a film that Max Bear Jr., a.k.a. Jethro, from the Beverly Hillbillies, directed in the mid-70s, that's based on the Bobby Gentry song uh, that's really this beautiful Southern Gothic ballad about this mysterious death uh, that is very haunting. But I, I really wanted it to have that energy, um, or even, as I mentioned, The Wild Child. But, yeah, I don't know. I, at the same time, I don't want to knock it too hard because I would much rather see something like this 
you know, somewhat uh, original storytelling at the multiplex than another Marvel film. I would recommend it. I could see people liking I could see someone like my mom liking it um, because it is... I mean, I did get emotional at points, but mainly around this woman being mistreated and having her heart broken and people being mean to her. And then, of course, people being kind to her made me emotional. So it did it, it did keep my attention. It, it needed to work through Tate coming back. Is like, this woman has extreme abandonment issues. Well, that's the and thing. You can, I mean, and you taught her how to read and write and you can write to her. Right. I mean, yes. That's why I think it's just too rich of a story. But that, you know, I... You know, I have a lot of books on my nightstand to read, but mm -hmm. I could see myself reading this book. Yeah, for sure. If I had thought of it, I would have made time to do so, but I didn't. What would you give it? I, also, we didn't talk about the title, which I don't like. Well, you know, just empirically, where the crawdads sing sounds poetic, but then in the movie, it's brought up twice where someone just says, like, oh, Mimi, where the crawdads sing, and okay. Well, because crawdads are crayfish, and they don't sing. They make this weird little noise, and... Her mother had told her the story that the younger brother says, uh, where you go meet us when you're fleeing for your life from your abusive dad, go deep into the marsh where the crawdads sing. So it makes sense. I, yeah. It, I think it could have been called the Marsh Girl well, for the amount of time they say it. Can you imagine? Then you'd be criticizing that. No. No? no? Okay. The, like Marsh Girl, that sounds like Wild Child. I, to me, I think to the it. title in, invokes something a little more poetic. And I do. Again, sure, but then I think maybe the finesse of the screenplay is, is what hobbles that then. Sure. You can get away in a film with saying the line of the title of the movie. I don't mind that inherently, but then how it comes across, like, okay. Sure. What would you give it? Two and a half. I would give it two and a half as well, out of five, since people sometimes aren't clear on that. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs> Ah! Uh -huh.